Okay, today's topic is matter and minerals. So minerals are basically the building blocks for rocks. The definition of a rock is two or more minerals. So when you have a, a clustering of minerals together, this is how rocks are formed. So for example, igneous rocks, which we'll look at, which, we're gonna, which will be our next lecture, volcanoes and igneous rocks. In a typical granite, there's at least four different minerals in any given granite. So we'll talk about minerals first. So the definition of a mineral, it has basically four parts to it. First part is that by definition it is naturally occurring. Although humans do make minerals, we actually grow crystals in one of our labs and we take a compound that is typically found in minerals and we grow these minerals over about a period of about eight weeks, eight to ten weeks. So it's naturally occurring. Inorganic solid, so this is probably one of the key components. It's inorganic. It means there's mon no biological components whatsoever. So coal is actually a rock. Coal has organic material. It has compositions of dead plants and animals that made up that coal. So coal does not qualify as a mineral. It is a rock, though. It has an ordered internal molecular structure, and it has a definite chemical composition. So minerals can be either an element, like gold can actually form a crystal form, a mineral, or it can be a compound, two or more elements, such as sodium, which is a metal, and chlorine, which is a gas. Those two elements come together to form sodium chloride, as the chemists call it. As geologists call that mineral, we call it halite, and any common person would call that salt. So salt is actually a mineral. We eat it almost every day. So to put all these things together, a naturally occurring inorganic solid with an ordered internal molecular structure and a definite chemical structure. So as chemistry, it has a crystal structure to it, inorganic. So here are two minerals. The gold color mineral is a mineral called pyrite, also known as fool's gold. Pyrite's chemical formula is iron and sulfur. So sulfur is a yellow mineral. And Iron is a dark gray mineral, so metal. So when these two occur, the dark iron and the yellow colored sulfur, they produce a gold mineral. This other mineral here, these little hexagonal prisms, is quartz. Quartz is a combination of silica, SI, and oxygen. So silica is a sem semiconductor, a metal, and then oxygen, we breathe. So when silica and oxygen combine, they form a mineral called quartz. We use this for everyday glass. So uses of quartz. Quartz is used in the production of glass. It's also used in crystal radios. It's all a very important component in a lot of uh, microchips, microprocessors for computers. Quartz along with some other minerals are actually what we build computer chips out of. So chips that we find in phones that all your memory stored in, your phone numbers, your music, is basically stored on semiconductor chips that are composed of quartz compounds. So pyrite, this is a naturally occurring cube of pyrite. So pyrite is one of those minerals that can form in nature's ultimate form and that's cubic. So all minerals will love to form a cubic form, but a lot of can't because their chemistry is too complex. In this case, pyrite is a simple chemical formula, iron and sulfur, and it is able to form a cube, so these are not cut, these have been polished, these cubes, these are naturally occurring. So this is a pyrite, and the other white mineral in there was talc. Pyrite's a good source of ore, iron ore. And sulfur is used in the reduction of acids, so we can use two of the elements if we break the pyrite down. We can use the iron for ore, and we use the sulfur to produce acids. And then talc is used as lubricants, it's used as a buffer, and it used to be used in powder that people put on their bodies, but because of the chemical, the complex chemistry of talc, it actually causes cancer in females, ovarian cancer, and people who actually use talc, companies that use it to produce talcum powder or powder that you put over your body, are now being sued because of the chemistry and what it does to our bodies. But it's a naturally occurring compound. It's a naturally occurring mineral. So life saving minerals, well, minerals are the sources for all of our consumer products. So everything that we use in our life, everything from our iPhones to our automobiles, all these 
come from minerals. So it's where we get the steel, it's where we get the aluminum. Even the plastic parts in a car are derivatives of petroleum, and basically petroleum, as we look when we look at sedimentary rocks, petroleum is actually stored in rocks, and it's a, one of these complex processes. So interesting, California is known as the Golden State, 49ers, the gold rush of 1849 brought a lot of people out west. California became a state, and we adopted the name the Golden State. So California is known as the Golden State. Nevada, which is to the east of us, a lot of silver was discovered there, and they named Nevada the Silver State. Ironically is that Nevada right now is the second largest producer of gold in the world. They're number one in the United States. But yet, so Nevada outproduces California with respect to gold, and they're known as a silver state. And in California right now, there's a lot of silver mining going on. A good example of an old silver mine that has since then closed down is now a tourist ghost town, is the old ghost town of Calico out near Barstow. And in California, we have an awful lot of other resources. We have copper, we have rare earths, we have barite, we have platinum. Platinum is used as a hardener for gold. It's used to make white gold. Palladium groups of uh, elements are used in catalytic converters of automobiles to make them less polluting. And so this is a map of the United States, Hawaii, and Alaska. And you'll notice that all of these are different types of minerals. So the lower red dots are construction materials. This is concrete, clays, gypsum, things that we normally use to build homes and buildings. The uh, little upside down um, blue pyramids, these are actually major rock, these are actually minerals. So these are actually hard minerals. And then the yellow squares are actually metals. These are ore processing metals such as iron, magnesium, the heavy metals that we use in the production of automobiles and steel beams for buildings. And so the United States has a wide distribution of a lot of different resources, mineral resources. So the difference between countries that are rich and countries that are poor is primarily the amount of minerals that have been discovered and the minerals is what basically is used to feed the economy. Unfortunately with respect to geology, this is the one aspect of geology that is troublesome. We have to extract an awful lot of rock, crush that rock, in order to obtain the metals that we need, the resources that we need. So resource extraction is a big problem because it has a huge environmental footprint. And this is an, actually an open pit mine. These are actually roads that trucks use to get down to the bottom of this mine. This is an open pit mine in Utah, in Bingham, Utah. This is actually a, one of the largest copper mines in the world. So we have to scar a lot of the landscape. We have to remove a lot of rock and crush that rock. We create a lot of waste in order to obtain the metallic minerals and just the minerals in general that we need for our society. One good thing, as population increases and there's an increase in metals, there is incentive to now recycle. And so currently, the metal that has the highest recycling rate of all metals, and this is worldwide, is aluminum. And the reason for that is that the energy requirement in order to recycle aluminum, we'll talk this later on at the towards the end of the lecture, is that aluminum has a very high cost associated with it. It takes an awful lot of energy to extract raw aluminum from the rock, from the clay that it's found in. And so it's much easier energy-wise, much more efficient to recycle old cans. So that's why worldwide, even states that don't have a redemption value on cans like California does, they recycle the aluminum cans because of the cost of them. You can actually get decent money for aluminum cans. So rocks, which is what our next subject will be next week when we talk about igneous rocks first. Rocks, by definition, is an aggregate of minerals. So granites consist of quartz, a mineral called plagioclase, and then mica minerals, which are used for computer chips. Huge part of computer chip components and memory chips in general for phones, tablets, so forth, are derived from the mica minerals. So this is a typical granite. 
This particular granite has three minerals. It has quartz, very common. It has biotite, this is the dark mineral. And then this pink material here is a mineral called potassium feldspar, which is also a source for aluminum because one of the chemical complexity of this mineral is it's potassium aluminum silicate, so we use it for a source of potassium and aluminum. And so here is just a representation of the minerals in their natural state. This is, these are the minerals that then make up a granite. So granite is an igneous rock that in this particular piece of granite consists of four minerals. And so composition of minerals. So in, our, in the periodic table of elements, there's 92 naturally occurring elements that we know of on Earth today. There are some other elements, if you look at the periodic table, that are created in fusion reactors that have very short lives. So those are kind of human-induced. We think that perhaps everything above a 92 might occur somewhere out there in the universe under different conditions than what we find here on Earth. But currently, we know that there's 92 naturally occurring minerals or elements. These elements can form a mineral. Or when two or more elements come together, well, they can also form a mineral. So minerals can consist of one element, such as carbon. So carbon, interestingly enough, when it's formed in a volcano, intense heat, intense pressure, it forms a diamond. And diamonds right now are the hardest substance known to humans. And basically a diamond is nothing more than carbon. Now carbon that forms at the surface forms graphite, and we'll use graphite as a very soft mineral. So this is a total opposite from diamond, and carbon we actually use for a mineral. Graphite, and graphite is what's in pencils. So pencils do not contain lead, they contain graphite. So two or more elements can make up a mineral, so this is what we call a compound. So a compound is two or more elements. An element that stands by itself is simply an element. So a good example of that is sodium combines with chlorine to form sodium chloride, which is the mineral halite, or as people commonly refer to it as salt. So atoms, it's the smallest particle of matter. I don't know why atoms got truncated and abbreviated here, but it did. It retains the characteristic of an atom. So there are 92 naturally known elements, and there are 92 known atoms. So you can take that element and what that element is made out of is atoms. So you can't convert lead to gold because lead contains lead atoms, gold contains gold atoms. People have always talked maybe if we can mess around with the electron configuration that we can convert lead to gold. It's never going to happen because you would actually have to change the atoms. We haven't found a way to do that. So atoms are the smallest. They're the building blocks of all of the elements. So the composition of minerals. There's an atomic structure that actually brings these different compounds, these elements together to form the compounds. And so there's an atomic structure. And so what really does the work is called electrons. So these are negatively charged particles, and the electrons are like orbitals, almost like planets, that basically rotate around in orbitals around the central part of the atom called the nucleus. And that's where the atoms are. So it's the electrons that kind of really do the work. So electrons are negatively charged particles that surround the nucleus. And so they have different energy shells. So there's some atoms have many and some have fewer. It depends on where they are in the periodic table. We're not going to get too far into chemistry. So basically, this is the structure of an atom. Here's the nucleus. It consists of these little blue, which are protons, which are positive charge. The electrons are out here. These are negatively charged. And there's neutrons, which are the brown, and those basically are neutral. So because of this, you have these different electrons flowing down here. And if you're a really good stable compound, you're going to have eight electrons in your outer orbital. In most outer orbital, you want eight electrons. If you're missing one, say so you only have seven or you have six, then you're going to want to either capture an electron or share one with another element. And this is how elements come together to form compounds. One element might have eight in its outer orbital. Another element might have an additional orbital with one. 
and so they'll either share that electron or they'll exchange it back and forth and that results in a good outer shell consisting of eight and that's what you want for a good strong compound. So the composition of minerals. There's different types of bonds. So when these outer orbitals, these electrons, come together to satisfy that outer orbital to make those eight electrons, this is what we call a bond. And so there's bonds that are very strong and there are bonds that are extremely weak. So a good example of a weak bond would be sodium chloride, salt. You can actually separate the chlorine and the sodium. We do it all the time. There are mines out in the deserts that grow salt crystals. They then subject that in a solution to electricity. They separate the chlorine and they use that chlorine for making bleach, for making pool chlorine, for sanitizing pools. And then the sodium can be used to make metal. So sodium is a metal. And so that's a very good example of a weak bond. A very strong bond this is water. People have dreamed about taking water, splitting that compound, and taking the hydrogen and burning that as a fuel in automobiles. The problem with that is, is it takes more energy to break the H2O apart, the hydrogen from the oxygen, than the energy we get out of it. So it can be done, but we can't do it in an economically efficient way. And there are actually movies that have been written about it where somebody came up with a, a secret formula or a process where they can separate hydrogen and oxygen. But currently, it, just, it, it can be done, but it can't be done efficiently. So if we were able to do this economically, we could have put water in a gas tank of our car, and we would have some type of a reactor that could take and separate the hydrogen. We could burn that hydrogen in an automobile's engine, much like a lot of cars use natural gas. And then the pollutant would be oxygen. Wow, imagine that. Your car, sir, is putting out too much oxygen. We can't fit. We, we have to fail it for the emissions test, you know. Imagine that problem. And so what happens in ionic bonds, this is where the atoms are exchanging electrons constantly. So that outer orbital that has that eight electrons, one is missing, say, in sodium, and then chlorine has the extra, so they're, they're passing that electron back and forth. And this is basically what we call an ionic bond. These tend to be very weak bonds. The opposite of an ionic bond, so this is an ionic bond. So here, this might be sodium, this might be chlorine, then when I have these eight shells in this outer orbit, this one has an extra one, this one needs one, so what happens is this electron gets exchanged back and forth, back and forth. It's an efficient process, but it also results in a very weak bond. So this is the uh, molecular structure of salt of the mineral called, we call halite. So you have a chlorine atom surrounded by four sodiums. So this combination allows for salt to build nature's most perfect state, and that's a cube, a square. And it also help, helps satisfy that outer electron with the uh, valence number of eight, with the eight electrons in the outer valence there. Uh, covalent bonds are different than ionic bonds. Covalent bonds are strong. So this is where the orbitals of the atoms overlap one another, and it's the overlapping of these orbital shells that makes a strong bond, because here in covalent bonds, the atoms actually share the outermost electrons. They share them, they overlap their orbitals, and this makes a very strong bond. Water and oxygen do that. I mean, I should say hydrogen and oxygen do that in order to form water. So here's a covalent bond. Where here the outer orbitals, they overlap, and this results in a very strong bond, covalent bonds. So the difference between the covalent and the ionic is primarily the ionic bond. It's exchanging the electrons, and this is a problem because something might interfere with this exchange, and then these atoms would be broken apart. But with the covalent bond, much stronger, takes a lot more energy to separate these orbitals and therefore theirs is a much stronger bond. This is the problem with water right now, so if we could somehow find an efficient way to break this outer bond here, this overlapping orbitals, we could then use hydrogen as a fuel, and there really is no shortage of water. You can even, even do it with salt water, you just have to separate the, the, the chlorine, the sodium, and the chlorides, and we could actually use water as a fuel, but we don't have an efficient way to do that as of now, current technology. So the composition of minerals. There's other types of bonding. There's metallic bonds, so this is between a metal. So most metals have a negative charge to them. 
I mean a positive charge, sorry. So most metals have a positive charge. So metals are very subject to oxidation. So oxygen, which has a negative charge, can come along and attach itself to a lot of metals. And this is kind of an important process we'll talk about later on when we look at how we extract resources from rocks, such as gold. We can actually use a compound called cyanide, which is a poison, that has a negative charge. And the negative charge looks for anything with a positive charge, so cyanide attracts itself, it's a poison, to any metals. So this is another type of bond, it's called metallic bonding. It is fairly weak. So the structure of minerals, so minerals are basically atoms of elements. These elements come together to form compounds. As these elements form these compounds, these compounds are then going to form some type of a crystalline shape. In nature, the preferred state is a cube. But not all minerals can form cubes because their chemistry is just far too complex to form a cubic structure. So they form the next thing closest to a cube. And a lot of examples of, that's kind of close would be a hexagonal prism. So there is a definite internal molecular structure to minerals, which is why we see this surface expression as a crystal. So minerals would like to form cube, and a lot of minerals do form cubes. So halite is a good example. Pyrite does this. Uh, there's a mineral called galena, which is lead and sulfur. So if you have a simple chemistry, you can do that. Uh, cubohedrons, which are also known as dodecahedrons, Garnets form this because garnets are very complex. It consists of iron, calcium, magnesium, complex silicate. So there's just too many elements, too much complex structures to form a cube. So they form a, a cubohedron, or really known as a dodecahedron. So salt, because it's simple, sodium and chlorine, it can form a nice little packing of cubes. And minerals prefer this because it can stack atoms on top of one another, compounds can be in the stack, and this is really the, the alternative, this is, this is the preferred state in, in nature, so this is ultimate, everybody wants to form a cubic structure. So polymorph, this is kind of an interesting thing, so a lot of it has to do with the chemistry, the background, where these things are formed. So carbon is a good example. Carbon can form a diamond, and it can also form a mineral called graphite. The difference in the two minerals, graphite and diamond, is simply where it is formed. Diamonds are formed in volcanoes. They're called a deposit called kimberlites. And diamonds are formed under intense heat and intense pressure. <clears throat> so that heat and pressure gradient results in a crystalline structure. So diamonds actually form an octahedrons where carbon doesn't have any mineral form whatsoever. It's amorphous. And the reason it's amorphous is that carbon that in the form of graphite is formed at the surface low. So low temperature, low pressure, carbon's going to form graphite. High temperature, high pressure, carbon's going to form diamond. And we call these polymorphs. So polymorph basically is the same composition but different minerals. And this primarily has to do with where they're formed. So the best example of that is diamond. In graphite, diamond is high pressure, high temperature. Graphite, low pressure, low temperature. So this is actually the structure of a diamond because it's formed with heat and pressure. The carbon atoms align themselves in a geometric configuration. Very hard compound. You can't break this. It's the hardest known substance on Earth currently. Diamond on a scale of 1 to 10 has a hardness of a 10. Graphite, on the other hand, is very soft. You can scratch it with your fingernail. It's used in lubricants. It's used in pencil leads. It's very soft. And basically, it's also carbon, but it forms these little sheets. And these sheets are vulnerable, very weak bonding. And the result is you can scratch it with your fingernail. So what we do is we have to look at a bunch of properties in order to identify minerals. So we look at a mineral. And we look at its properties. Is it hard or is it soft? What color is it? What's the crystal form? How much does it weigh? Does it make a mark on a street plate? Does it react to acid? 
So there's all sorts of diagnostic properties that we use to identify minerals. So we do, first we do, like in a scientific method, we start off with an observation. So remember the scientific method? First step, observation. Then we're going to basically say, well, I think this is graphite, or I think this is lead, or like galena. And so how we're going to make that determination is we're going to look at the physical properties. Basically, we're going to perform an experiment. So we're going to look at it. Our problem is that we want to find out what the mineral is. We create a hypothesis. We think it's mineral X. And then the way we're going to go about that is we're going to look at the physical properties. That's going to be our experiment. And then once that experiment's done, we're going to evaluate it. We think, yeah, I think that this mineral is such and such. So one of the things we look at is the crystal form. This is the external expression of the mineral. So pyrite likes to form nice little cubes, which is almost a dead giveaway when you see it forming in cubes. Ironically, gold, which looks like pyrite, also forms cubes and it forms octahedron sometimes. So gold as an atom can form cubes. Iron sulfide, which we call fool's gold, can also form cubes. So crystal form. It's often interrupted due to competition. So in granite, granitic rocks, we don't find the crystals. We just find minerals that are kind of rounded because they're competing for space. They don't have time to grow. And then so different chemical formulas are going to produce different crystal shapes. So here's a garnet. Very complex state. So a lot of chemistry in this. It can't form a cube, so it forms what we call a dodecahedron. And so this is a naturally occurring garnet. The perch shape is a cube, but minerals such as quartz can't form the cube, so instead they form a pyramid. So the ultimate state in nature is cube, but because of complex chemistries, not all compounds, not all minerals can form cubes. Instead, they have to form other shapes. So pyrite is a good example. It has a very simple chemistry and can form cubes. In this particular case, these two cubes are actually twin. They got lazy and they shared the same one of the same axes. So there's like three axes, A, B, and C axis in a uh, mineral. And this is the per first shape in nature. Where garnets, it's just too complex chemistry. It cannot form a cube. It would like to, but it can't. Galena is an interesting mineral. It forms cubes, so nice to form those little squares. It also has a luster where it's metallic. So that's another thing we look at. We like look at not just the crystal form, we look at the luster. Is it shiny? Is it dull? Is it metallic? Is it semi-metallic? So there's a lot of different um, tools we use in order to identify minerals. So luster. Luster basically has to do with the appearance of a mineral reflected light. It's how that mineral reflects light. Is it dull? Or is it vitreous? So vitreous is a fancy word saying it means shiny. Is it earthy looking? Is it metallic? So metallic would be something like coins, like dimes, quarters, and nickels. That's a good example of metallic. Old cars used to have chrome bumpers on them. That's a really good example of metallic. But metallic does not have to be shiny. Metal can be non-shiny. A good example would be a frying pan. That's about as metallic as you're going to get. It's iron. And so we look at the appearance of light, we look at if it's metallic or non-metallic, and then we look at it, is it shiny, vitreous, is it silky, is it earthy? So those are diagnostic features of minerals, and it tells a little bit about, about the environment where they were formed. So color is what we see first, and a lot of times color can be tricky, so a good example is the element copper. Copper can make something turn brown, it can make it, sometimes it turns green, blue, yellow. So copper does some interesting things. So a lot of the exotic, exotic coloration that we see in minerals that we see in gemstones are produced by impurities. So diamonds are just plain simply clear. They're transparent. They're a pure form of carbon. But when carbon gets then interfered with something else, like another element creeps in, you can actually change the color of a diamond and sometimes turn them pink. So that's the big thing right now in gemology is people are looking for pink diamonds. They're worth a lot. So a pink diamond basically is not a pure form of carbon. 
it's carbon with another element in it to give it that pink colorization. So quartz, as it turns out, has very variety of colors. It can be clear, transparent, like a diamond, look like glass. It sometimes has a smoky look to it because a little uranium snuck into it, giving it this dark color. Um, minerals like manganese can slip into quartz and turn it purple. Uh, purple quartz, basically, we call that amethyst. And that's basically what it is. So amethyst is nothing more than purple quartz. And then there's citrine. So both citrine and amethyst are actually used as gemstones. So in a really nice crystal form, in a pure form, they're hard and they make nice gemstones for, for jewelry. Streak, you take the mineral and you rub it on a tile, ceramic tile, and it leaves behind a streak, a color. Uh, some minerals have absolutely no streak whatsoever, and others have very diagnostic streaks. So a good example of a mineral that does not have a streak is quartz. You can rub it on the tile all day long, and you're not going to get any colorization on that tile. But if you take a mineral called hematite and rub it on that um, streak plate, it's going to produce a red-brown color. If you took gold and rub it on a streak plate, it's going to leave a gold streak. If you take fool's gold and rub it on a streak plate, it's going to produce gray color. So that's one of the diagnostic features that you can tell the difference between real gold and what we call fool's gold, pyrite. So here's a street plate. This is some piece of pyrite. When I rub this street, when I rub this mineral across this tile plate, it leaves behind a grayish color. If this had been real gold, it would have left a gold street behind. So back in the day when the miners came to town with all their pyrite, and they thought they were rich and they were going to buy everybody a drink at the saloon. If they simply had a ceramic tile with them out in the field, they could have rubbed that pyrite across that ceramic tile and it would have told them, no, this is not gold, this is fool's gold. So that's why it was named fool's gold. We call that mineral pyrite because it fooled a lot of people who thought it was gold. Hardness. So we have a thing called the Mohs hardness scale. And so the Mohs hardness scale goes from 1 to 10. So you can see down here, one, two, three, four, they're kind of clustered together. So there's not a whole lot of difference between so just a one to do a two to a three. It's an increment of one. Notice you start seeing a little bit of spacing between orthoclase and quartz. That's because quartz is, yeah, it is a hardness of seven versus orthoclase, which is hardness of six. But there is a big difference between orthoclase and quartz. And then there's another big gap between quartz and topaz, which is a gemstone. And there's a huge gap between corundum, which is ruby, and topaz. And then look at the gap between rubies and diamonds. So diamonds are much, much more harder. So you can see on a graduated scale that this is an exponential scale. So once you start getting above the hardness of fives, the hardness goes exponentially upwards. So that's mathematically exponential. So diamond is far more harder than corundum, which is a nine. Another physical property is cleavage. So minerals, as it turns out, when they're subject to a breakage, when you hit them with a hammer, they will break along planes of weak bonds. This produces black, basically a flat, shiny surface, which is very important. And sometimes they'll break off into geometric shapes. So some minerals that have the ionic bonds, the weaker bonds, will actually cleave. Minerals that have a covalent bond, the very strong bonds such as quartz, don't cleave. They fracture. That's because they have such a strong bond and there's a lot of resistance to breaking there. So these are some of the, the, the geometric shapes that are found. You can have planes of cleavage that are flat, like pieces of paper. You can have foams at 90 degrees. You can have minerals that form at 60 and 120 degrees. And so you have different minerals. You have some minerals that have four directions of cleavage. They form these little octahedrons. Fluorite does that. Halite will form a cube. The mineral calcite will form a 6120, which we call rhombohedral. And so here are three different minerals with three different directions of cleavage. The fluorite forms the octahedrons. The um, halite, the salt, forms cubic. And the uh, calcite forms is 6120, close to a cube, but what we call rhombohedral. 
fracture. So minerals that have very strong bonds, such as quartz, they won't cleave. They have covalent bonds. They're very strong. So in that case, when those minerals are impacted or hit with a hammer, they fracture. So fracture really is the absence of cleavage. Then there's specific gravity. This is basically how heavy a mineral is. So some minerals, the atoms are more compact and more dense. They're together, they're closer. That makes that mineral much more heavier. So you, good example, you take a ton of feathers and a ton of lead. Which weighs more? Well, they weigh the same. They both weigh a ton. However, the spacing of feathers take a large room to get a ton of feathers, where lead, it would take a very small area in order to form a ton of lead. So basically, doesn't it gravity, basically it's the weight of the mineral, and basically it is how close the atoms are together. So lead, as it turns out, is very well compacted and it forms very heavy minerals. Same with iron. So this is conchoidal fracture. This is a mineral that does not have cleavage. When it's hit with a hammer, it breaks randomly and it forms this kind of like circular curvature to it when it breaks and we refer to this as a conchoidal fracture. Glass does this, so you take a window, hit it with a baseball, it breaks randomly into conchoidal fractures. Then there's special and specific properties to minerals. These are things that are very special to that particular mineral only. So there's actually a mineral called magnetite. And it has a unique pro property that it's magnetic. So you take a magnet, a magnet will only stick to the mineral magnetite. There are other minerals that contain iron, but they don't contain enough iron to make them magnetic, where magnetite is magnetic. In fact, it is a magnet, and that's what natural magnets are made from. Some minerals react to hydrochloric acid, so you can put acid on minerals. It fizzes, so calcite's a good example of that. Um, quartz basically does not react to any acid except for one, hydrofluoric acid. And then sometimes you have to break the mineral, you have to file it to get a very slow reaction not to hydrochloric acid. Some minerals taste like salt, so those are the salt rocks, the halites. Sulfur smells like fireworks. Some minerals have a very high elastic, you can bend them. The mica minerals do that. Uh, graphite marks on paper, we use graphite to make pencils, to produce pencils. So there's 4,000 minerals that have been named. And so rocks are aggregate minerals, and some of the common rock-forming minerals are minerals like quartz, orthoclays, the micas. Those minerals come together to form rocks. And that'll be our next week's chapter when we start looking at igneous rocks, and all igneous rocks originate from magma. So as it turns out, of all of the material on Earth, the, all those 92 elements I've been talking about, eight of them are essential. So basically there's eight of them. Silica, oxygen, potassium, chlorine, iron. Those are the essential elements that make up minerals. And it's the minerals that are building blocks for the rocks. So we actually classify minerals based on chemistry. So for example, if you consist of silica, SiO2, then you're a silicate. But it's a native elements, copper, gold, lead, graphite. These are native elements. And there's oxides. So oxides is any element or combination of that contains oxygen, so O2. Sulfides contain sulfur. So a good example is pyrite, which is full of gold, is iron, Fe, and S2, sulfur. Then there's sulfates, which contain sulfur and oxygen together. SO3, SO4 compounds. Then there's halides, which are basically naturally occurring um, gases, oh, way on the other side of the periodic table. Chlorine, fluorine, boron, those are gases. And then there's carbonates, which contain CO3, carbon, oxygen on the cube state. And so we classify minerals based on chemistry. So the chemistry of the mineral, what elements it has, which is chemistry. Basically, it's the classification of minerals. And then here's a good example of native copper. Copper occurs just naturally. It's copper. Copper is unstable, though, because a copper atom has a positive charge at the end of it. 
And then oxygen, which has a negative charge, comes along and oxidizes it. So we take copper out of the ground, it's nice and shiny. But when you leave it exposed at the surface, oxygen could come along, bind itself because it's got that positive charge sticking out here. Come find me, oxygen, and oxygen does. A good example is that is pennies. So brand new pennies, they come out of the mint, are nice and shiny. Over time, they turn that brown color. That brown color is because oxygen has oxidized that copper, making it turn brown. So what we mine, this is something I definitely want you to know, ore. Ore is a rock or mineral compound that has sufficient enough material in it to make it valuable economically. So it's got to be economically valuable. So a good example is that right now with the price of gold going up, places that have gold in very low quantity, where it's disseminated, spread out in the rock, microscopic gold, is now becoming feasible to open up old gold mines. Because when gold starts going up in price, it now becomes more economically attractive to look at areas where we couldn't mine gold, say when it was like $800 or $1,000 an ounce. So gold increase in prices of gold has resulted in a lot of mines opening up. So ore is rocket which has a valuable or useful mineral occurs at a concentration high enough to make it economically attractive. And so there are places in the Mojave Desert where maybe there's one ounce of gold for two tons of rock that was not economically efficient when gold was $1,000 an ounce. They couldn't mine it. They make a profit. It cost them $1,400 to get an ounce of gold that's worth a thousand. You can't do it. But now when gold goes up to $1,800 to $1,000 an ounce, those areas now become attractive. The bad thing about mining is it's a huge environmental impact. So back in the old days, when the 49ers came across, they were looking for surficial gold. They were looking for gold and rocks that they could see along with other metals such as silver. And so they started digging tunnels, they started strip mining. Uh, the bad thing about mining is when you have an underground cave or an underground tunnel, human-made tunnel, those tunnels are subject to collapse, they're subject to accumulation of carbon dioxide, which is odorless, colorless, and kill people very easily. And methane gases, which then can be ignited, so there's a lot of hazards with underground mining. Plaster mining is basically where you strip. So the early plaster mining is where they took high pressure hoses and they did this around Sacramento. They basically mowed down the whole landscape. They cut down the trees, they cut down the topography. And the gold being heavy is going to settle off the bottom. So they're basically washing away all the, light colored, all, all the lightweight material outward. That creates a lot of sediment runoff and pollutes rivers very nasty process. And then tailings are basically the deposits that were in the mine. We'll put them out on the surface now. They contain a lot of heavy metals. Uh, when it rains, those metals are picked up. They then are washed into the aquatic systems and the rivers, streams, and even groundwater. So mining has some very detrimental impacts on the environment. So plaster mining, hydraulic mining, this is where California was first discovered when they discovered that gold at Sutter's Mill, they basically came in with high pressure hoses and they just mowed everything down. Because in the case of the Sutter Hills, the Sutter Mills area, all those hills around that were alluvial material, loose gravel that contained nuggets of gold within it. So they would just go out there with high pressure hoses and just mow down the whole landscape. Huge impacts. Today we use strip mines, open pit mines. This has a huge carbon footprint and just a footprint in general. I don't, I don't always like when people use it as a carbon footprint because it's not necessarily carbon. In the case of mining, it's, it's a metal footprint. But we have a huge scarring impact that occurs because of mining. And this is the one side of geology that I don't particularly care for, is the amount of landscape that we have to destroy in order to obtain a small amount of those essential minerals. So. Because of all the mining in the United States, this is the irony. <clears throat> so think about this. 1849 is the gold rush. 1849. Miners came out here. They mined all the gold in California. Most of them left poor. They thought there was, the ground was just paved with gold and they just to go pick it up and put it in their pockets and be rich. 
They came all the way across the country and covered wagons to do that. And so it isn't until 1977, until the first Mining Act is, is passed by Congress, called SMERCLA, which means Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act. It required miners to actually go in and reclaim the land they disturbed. So if you went in, you extracted all these resources, you made lots of money. Now, we want you to go back in and kind of fill it in, replant the trees, kind of try and return it back to this natural landscape. Uh, the problem with Smirkla is it's very expensive. And other countries don't have Smirkla. So as a result, a lot of copper mines all throughout the southwestern United States, throughout Arizona especially, those mines have shut down because of Smirkla. And instead we import a lot of our copper from South America, from Chile, from Argentina. So there's good and bad to environmental regulation. It provides a lot of jobs for environmental people, but at the same time it does add cost. And with economies not being of the same scale globally, that puts the United States in a huge comparative disadvantage because our costs are gone up. And we have other regulations such as, you know, uh, unions will put a lot of regulation on companies, and then there's safety, and there's a lot of regulation that makes mining a little difficult. One of the side and the bad aspects of mining is that we do disturb an awful lot of land. And I do like the smirkler where we actually make the mining companies go in and recontour and replant the trees. I think that should be done because a lot of foreign companies have come into the United States. And during the Clinton administration, Clinton passed some really strict laws on, against mining. And so a lot of those miners, those people, the Mexican people walked away because the filing fees were so expensive that multinational corporations from foreign countries came in and bought our mines. They turned around, they mined it, and then they walked away. And we can't do anything about it because these mines have, these companies have been transferred in um, ownership and do the cloak and dagger of foreign investment companies, they basically have gotten away with murder. One of the bad things about mining is that we disturb the soil. That can then result in runoff, a lot of metal poisoning. This affects aquatic systems, impacts fish. And this is actually a coal mine. And interesting thing about this, it's hard to see in the slide, but down here is a full-size pickup truck and this is a huge shovel that is strip mining this area in order to mine coal. So it's actually in the Four Corners area in New Mexico where they're mining this coal. Whoops, and something there's a black slide there. All right. So this is an interesting process, and I want you to know about this. This is where we take a compound called cyanide. We take cyanide, which has a negative charge, and we use it to extract metals. So what we do is take rock we, out of a hill, strip mine, put it on trucks. Those trucks then are offloaded by this little uh, shovel here. They place this crushed rock on a nice clay um, pad. This clay pad is impermeable. In other words, it will not allow water to penetrate through it. So what they do is they take the crushed rock that they took out of the trucks, they then put this material on top of this clay pad, and they use it use a sprinkler system in order to distribute water and cyanide. So this water solution contains 90% water and 10% cyanide. And the way this works is as the cyanide water solution work their way through the rock, the cyanide, which has a negative charge, picks up any metallic element. So copper has a positive charge, zinc, gold, silver, they have positive charges. So all those metals then concentrate in this little pond. They then take that and they pump out that solution. They go into this nice little building here where they take that solution, they zap an electrode to it, 
and they get all these metals together, and then they heat it, and they use the different melting points of the different metals to separate them out. So for example, lead has a very low melting point. So it's one of the first metals to drop out. As you raise the temperature, gold is one of the last metals. So gold and iron are the last metals to separate out. And so this is a very efficient process where you can take an open pit mine, take that ore, put it onto a pad, crush that rock, sprinkle a solution of water and cyanide, and that cyanide will pick up all those metallic elements we can then separate them out. And the one that we're looking for really is the gold. So the gold is the end unit. So the other metals that come along with it are kind of freebies. It's like, well, we're looking for the gold, but we're also picking up a little bit of, of iron, a little bit of potassium. Why not? They're metals. And that's a typical process. So the cyanide extraction is we use a compound of carbon and nitrogen called cyanide. This is rat poison, basically. And this compound has a negative charge, and it will pick up any metallic element with a positive charge. So as it turns out, gold, silver, copper, iron, zinc, lead, platinum. I don't know why I put zinc and iron again. I must like those two. They all have positive charges. So when the negative cyanide comes along, it attracts the positive. So in nature, positive and negative, they attract each other. Opposites. And we form now a compound of cyanide and these metals. We take an electrode, we zap it, all those iron molecules are attracted to the electrode. Pull the electrode out of the solution, you got this big gray looking thing with metals. You heat that. As you increase the temperature, uh, zinc is of low temperature mineral, so is copper, uh, so is lead. So those are the first metals that are going to pull out. So you control your heat, you get rid of all the zinc, heat it a little bit more. You get rid of the lead, heat a little bit more, then the silver will start to melt. And as you get rid of those metals, and you increase the temperature. And so gold, which is the high, one of the higher temperatures, gold and iron, occur at very high temperatures. So this is a process, it's a very efficient process. Recycling makes sense, uh, especially when we look at the um, energy required for mining. So it's not just the mining, it takes a lot of energy to dig a hole in the ground. It takes a lot of energy to crush that rock. It takes a lot of energy to then refine that rock into the metals and then to then transport it. And then take that metal and melt it back down again to make it into I-beams or whatever we're going to make it into, into sheet metal. A lot of energy involved in this process. So this is why recycling makes sense. So some things it makes perfect sense to recycle and other things are a little bit more difficult. So glass is a good example. So this column here shows all the energy requirement to make new glass out of sand. So we take quartz sand, like beach sand. You can melt it into glass. So in order to produce new glass from sand, it takes 25 units. From scrap, it also takes 25 units. So there's a lot, not a whole lot of incentive to recycle glass, because glass is dirty. You, know, you have to separate the brown bottles from the green bottles from the clear bottles, and then you have to wash them. And you know, and then people throw the bottles in the waste thing; they're half full of soda or whatever. Steel from new from rock takes 50 units. From scrap steel from old cars, from old washers, appliances, it takes 26 units. So perfect sense to recycle um, steel. Plastics are a disaster. Of all the things, if I wish we could get rid of anything, it's the plastics. They're just a total disaster because there's so many different chemical compounds that make up plastics. And, you know, you, you go to a, a convenience store, you can buy one brand of water and another brand of water and look at the plastic bottles. They're completely different compounds. So recycling plastics is a problem. You have to separate out these different plastic families these different compounds. A good example is automobiles. <clears throat> so most automobiles have a plastic bumper cover on them. So my friend has an auto shop and he has to have like three different adhesives for just Honda because the bumper cover on a Civic is different than that on a Cord or on a RAV4. They're different. Toyota is RAV4, but they're different compounds. So you just have these different compounds because the plastics and these bumpers differ. So Toyota's 
plastic compounds are different from Honda. Honda's different from General Motors. And so you have all these different plastics. So this is why plastic is a problem. But let's look at aluminum. The most recycled metal in the world. In order to make new aluminum, it takes 250 units of energy from scrap, from cans. Eight. Big differential between 250 and eight. This is why aluminum is the most recycled metal in the world right now because the energy requirements to produce raw aluminum from rock, from clay, it's very expensive. As it turns out, most of the bauxite the aluminum um, are found in very warm, very tropical environments. So we have to go into a place in, in an equatorial region in order to mine these. Copper, again, 60 units for new, 7 for recycled. So that's why people go out and they steal copper out of buildings. And there's copper thieves out there. And then paper, 24 units for to cut down a tree. And, and, and there's another factor we should, we should actually add in there, another little factor about, you know, the... Uh, Degradation of the atmosphere because I, the, the irony here is that we're cutting down trees. And if we're worried about carbon dioxide, you need to plant more trees because by planting more trees, that brings in CO2. And from scrap, 15. So there's, there's good incentive to recycle paper. We can make paper in the cardboard, we can reuse it again. I like to buy paper that is made from recycled paper. And so oil and gas are fossil fuels. We're going to, when we're talking about sedimentary rocks, oil and gas is basically an accumulation of hydrocarbons. So these are biological components, plants, animals, microscopic uh, plankton in oceanic environments that have accumulated and then over geological time compressed into gas or oil. And most of the gas is a gas. Oil is actually a thick fluid. And so most fossil fuels, so what we call fossil fuels, were formed in a geological period about 350 million years ago to 290 million years ago. So within that geological period, this is when most of those organic materials were formed at a geological time known as the Mississippi and the Pennsylvanian. This time is when Pangea was all together, one big supercontinent. That supercontinent was at the equator. Lots of biodiversity at that time. A lot of rainforest. And all these rainforests, all this accumulation of organic material was buried, compacted, and over geological time converted into oil. So a lot of the uh, fossil fuels that we mine, the coal, and a lot of the oils came from this geological period. So in other words, Fossil fuels are not renewable. It's going to take the Earth a long, long time in order to produce new fossil fuels. So once those fossil fuels are depleted, they're done. We're not going to be able to reduce them the way nature did. So offshore, close to California, we have these offshore oil rigs. There's a lot of uh, natural gas. There's a lot of oil off our coast in California. And if you look at coal, so coal is basically the rock that was responsible for the Industrial Revolution in Europe. And then after the Industrial Revolution in Europe, there was one in the United States, there's one going on in China, the next one's going to be Pakistan and India. And coal has been a very important player in the economic development of countries. Even China right now is using a lot of coal to produce electricity, to basically act as an energy for its factories. So if you look at Europe and Asia, this would be Northern Europe and this would be South, uh, or basically with the uh, East Asia, they have 30%, Europe and Eurasia at 36%, North America at 26%. So North America, most of that is in the United States. And this is where we find the mass of the coal, and this basically was used to spawn our Industrial Revolution. If you look at natural gas, <clears throat> So this is kind of an old pie chart. It shows the Mideast, which is basically Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, all those countries over there. They have 40% of the world's known natural gases. Russia at 26%. North America, which is Canada and the United States mostly, at 4.2%. But that's changed. 
because of fracking, because of fracking, today the United States has more natural gas than Saudi Arabia. And because of the technology increase, so there's where technology has expanded the base for resources. So natural gas is a good example of that. I mean, fracking is good in some ways, and in a lot of ways it's bad. It causes some environmental problems. It's causing earthquakes to occur in Oklahoma. It's resulting in pushing some of that natural gas into the water table. And there are people in Pennsylvania who, when they open up their kitchen faucet, they could put a cigarette lighter to it and it would catch on fire. That's scary. That is definitely an environmental impact. So today in the United States, worldwide, we have 21% of the world's known natural gas reserves. So we have a big piece of the pie right now, and that's due to technological innovations and fracking. So that's just incredible what we've been able to do. Oil. The reason that there's so much interest in the Mideast today is because oil is really what drives the global economy. Oil is our economic driver. And you can see that Saudi Arabia has the largest portion of the oil, followed by Iraq, United Arab Emirates, Kuwait. And then when you look over here at the United States of America, you can barely see this, we have 2.7%. And yet as a country, Currently, we are consuming about 20% of the world's oil, and we have roughly about 5% of the population. So as other countries want to achieve the same economic standard of the United States, that's going to place a further impact and a demand for oil resources. So we're simply going to see an increase in the price over time. So energy use, we use ener energy for everything. We use it for automobiles, we use it for lights, we use it for microwave ovens, for washers and dryers. Our life is driven by energy and we're dependent on that energy. Most of that energy does result from the consumption of fossil fuels. So even people who drive Teslas, they plug them in at night when solar electricity is not being generated. So solar only works in the daytime. As soon as the sun goes down, there's no more solar. So if you're bringing your Tesla, especially in the wintertime, and you plug it into your house, that electricity being used to charge that Tesla or that other electric car is being produced by natural gas, by fossil fuels, right down the street at the, at the smokestacks. So that's a natural gas process where natural gas is being burned to produce electricity, and that's the supply of electricity for the city of Huntington Beach. So industrial right now uses about 38% of the... Um, known energy, that the energy budget, and then residential and commercial buildings. So commercial would be something like a store, a 7-Eleven, a mall, 36%. And transportation uses 26% of the energy. So this is all the trains, planes, automobiles that are used to move things, resources around. So the bad thing about this energy is we lose a lot of this energy as we convert from one form to the next. So good example. Down the street on the Pacific Coast Highway, there's the smokestacks. They produce electricity. So the way they do they produce electricity is they're burning natural gas. So they burn natural gas, they heat water. That water then is converted to steam. That steam then turns a turbine. That turbine spins, hooked up to a generator. That generator generates electricity. The electricity leaves that plant, goes along the power grid by the great big huge transmission towers. They're then converted down to smaller transmission towers. Some are underground if you live in a newer neighborhood. Some are above ground on poles. We then take that electricity, we run it through a transformer so we can convert it into your house. So it goes through all these different steps. And each step that we take results in a loss of the efficiency of energy. Our automobiles right now, they are about 10% efficient. So when you put that gallon of gas in there and and you fill up with that gallon of gas, you're only going to get 10% of that gas to actually use to move your car. So the way an automobile works is that gas goes through the injectors, the spark plugs fire it, you now convert that gasoline into a flame, pushes on a piston, another one is counterbalanced, it comes back up as one goes down, so they're doing this, that energy is in transformed into a crankshaft, 
that crankshaft is turning, it's hooked up to a flywheel, which also turns, that flywheel is hooked up to the transmission, which turns, which creates pressure, hydraulic pressure. That energy is then being transformed into the axles. The axles are then being transformed into the hub, which then spins the wheel so you can drive your car. So we go through all these little steps, and every time we go through one of those steps, we lose efficiency, so cars are very inefficient. Natural gas, this is a big push right now. There's a big push for natural gas. And the reason for natural gas is it is more efficient than most of the other energies is because we're burning it directly. We're taking the natural gas and we're igniting it in a furnace. So you're not converting it. So natural gas is far more efficient. And uh, a lot of people are converting automobiles into natural gas. There's a lot of natural gas. So all the OTOC buses are powered by natural gas. A lot of fleet vehicles, so corporations that have lots of vehicles, we use natural gas. The parking enforcement people in Huntington Beach, they're using natural gas, so it's a really good way, and it's less polluting than gasoline or diesel. So this ends minerals and those properties. And our next chapter will be igneous rocks and volcanoes. So we're going to get volcanoes and igneous rocks together.